Well, if you want to take a global view of the 1798 rebellion, you need to go back initially 10 years to 1788 and take a look at what's happening in France. Louis XVI has taken over the throne from his father. He has somehow or other managed to take the poison chalice because he discovers that all the French peasants hate him. He wants to try and solve this problem, so he turns to a friend, Maximilien Robespierre. Robespierre is a guy who is very, very interested in the welfare of the peasants. He's rich, he's a lawyer, he's a politician, but his basic interest is in the poor. Robespierre is tasked with the job of going out, talking to the peasants and finding out why they hate Louis XVI. It doesn't take very long for Robespierre to come back into the palace and give Louis the good news that he in fact has found out what is wrong with the peasants and not only does he know what's wrong with them, he knows how to solve it. This appeals, as you can imagine, very much to Louis and he automatically starts into solving the problem. The problem, as he discovers, is that the French peasants have no money, they have no jobs, they have no houses, they have no food, they have no livelihoods, they are destitute and have nothing. Robespierre, having told Louis this, then tells him what, in his estimation, is the solution. And the solution is quite simple. Tax the monarchy, tax the nobility, because the poor have nothing more that they can give you. This, as you can imagine, is not what Louis wants to hear. So, rather than impose taxes or try to impose taxes on his friends and his family, Robespierre turns his attention to his court advisers. They have a much better solution from Louis's point of view. And that solution is, go back into the palace, keep your head down, do nothing, say nothing, and in seven or eight months, this will have all blown over, it'll all be forgotten about, and it will all have gone away. This, as you can imagine, is exactly what Louis does, and he takes off back into the palace in 1788. Now, those set of circumstances had no great significance in this country. But three years after that, in 1791, Wolf Tone forms the Society of the United Irishmen. Now, this is an interesting scenario. Wolf Tone, very like Robespierre, is rich, he's a politician, he is a lawyer, and he has the basic interest of the poor at heart. Now, you would have to wonder why Wolf Tone would be so interested in the welfare of Roman Catholics, considering the fact that he is a Presbyterian solicitor. Well, it really is quite simple. Because he's a Presbyterian and not an Anglican, Wolf Tone is treated from the point of view of taxes as a Roman Catholic. But apart from that, when you look at the Roman Catholic way of life, you can't vote, you can't be on a committee, you can't have a house, you can't have a job. If you're lucky enough to have a little tenant farmhouse, you light a fire in it, that's great, that'll keep you warm, but because you're a Roman Catholic, you have to pay a hearth tax for the space on the floor that the fire takes up. If you want to let the smoke from the fire out and you knock a hole in the wall to let the smoke out, that's great, but because you're a Roman Catholic, you have to pay a light tax because daylight comes in through the hole in the wall. Hence the very popular phrase of daylight robbery. Wolf Tone wants to change this. 
So he forms the Society of the United Irishmen. They have their first meeting in Belfast. They are Catholic, Protestant, non-practicing, agnostic, Jew, Gentile, you name it. There are no religious bands, but they are all businessmen. Wolftone sets about reform on behalf of Roman Catholics in 1791. 1793, back in France, poor old Louis XVI has discovered that his court advisers have not been altogether accurate with their suggestions. In fact, they have been totally wrong. And what Louis discovers is that the peasants, instead of going away and all being forgotten about, the peasants have gone into open revolt. What is the thing to do? Louis is caught not knowing what way he should turn. The peasants, however, have a plan. Their plan is get into the palace, take Louis out, bring him up and throw him into the Bastille. Because conditions in the Bastille are pretty dreadful, but they are still much better than the conditions that the peasants are putting up with on the street. So Louis is taken out of the palace, he's brought up the road and he's thrown into the rat infested Bastille with the idea that maybe when he has a look at how the peasants are living, he might do something about their lifestyle. That is 1793 in France and that likewise has no significance in this country. 1796 however, things change in France. The peasants decide we are getting no help from the monarchy. We need to take the situation in our own hands. And what's the best way to do that? We will have a revolution. Having a revolution is a very good idea. There's only a problem. If you want to have a revolution, you need two basic ingredients, arms and ammunition. The French peasants have neither but they do have a very valuable piece of information. And that piece of information is that the arms and the ammunition in France are all stored in the Bastille. So we have a plan. We'll storm the Bastille. We'll take all the arms and the ammunition that they have there in storage. Bonus points on this. Since the root cause of our problem is also in the Bastille, in the form of Louis the 16th we will take him out of the Bastille as well we'll bring him up to the market square and we'll introduce him to our colleague Madame Guillotine this happens poor our Louis is taken out of the Bastille brought up the road has his head cut off and then the French peasants declare France to be a republic all of a sudden the situation in France is of huge interest to the people in Ireland. But who pays the greatest attention? The United Irishmen. They look at what has happened in France and their theory is, well, look, France has had 1200 years of sovereign rule. They have crawled out from under that stone and they are now ruling themselves. Why don't we take a leaf out of their book and break our links with England. This sets the course for the United Irishmen to change direction and begin a revolt on behalf of the country. They have had very successful years of reform on behalf of Roman Catholics. The Roman Catholic lifestyle is much different. They can vote, they can be on committees, they can have shops, they can have businesses. And so the United Irishmen consider that having succeeded to that extent with the Roman Catholics, they now need to turn their attention to the country. We took a molen and an escorty and westward storming drove out our 